Hello, and welcome back to Skyships. Today we will turn into a kind of astronauts. Presumably, in the beginning of 2018, SpaceX plans to launch its heaviest carrier rocket. And you know, I can't skip such an interesting event. But as usual, we will begin from a little afar. I want to talk about the SpaceX history and a bit about their first rocket. The history of SpaceX starts at the beginning of the 21st century, when a young millionaire Elon Musk, who is so loved by ones and hated by the others, decided to move from the Silicon Valley to the south, to Los Angeles. At that time he was the owner of XCOM company, which you've never heard of, which is now called PayPal, which you may already have heard of. Neither SpaceX nor Tesla Motors were around yet. Elon Musk was always a rather unusual guy, but now he has turned even more strange. This fact became especially noticeable when he began to constantly talk about space and buried himself in books about rocket engineering. Old vintage Soviet books about rocket engineering. This hobby was reinforced by the place he lived in. Los Angeles and all this part of California is a nest of the US aerospace industry. Here at every corner there is a huge or not so huge corporation, and this whole land is filled with people engaged with sky or space. Obviously he immediately got himself into a new space lovers company. At first it was the Mars Society. This organization seeks to spread the idea of colonizing other planets, first of all Mars. And this company includes such interesting people as a lover of walking in the unusual places, Buzz Aldrin, as well as an anime fan, James Cameron. Despite the fact that Musk at the time was nothing more than a kid with a strange name from somewhere in Africa, his enthusiasm was impressive. Besides, maybe he was from Africa, but his dollars were quite American. Nevertheless, the epic plans of Mars society were not so epic. But come on, all the world's plans for the development of outer space are not epic. Especially considering what we planned to achieve several decades ago. So, boredom and disappointment. Elon Musk created his own team. Over time, the boys' enthusiasm and money attracted people. The new team developed a plan to send a small automated station to Mars. A kind of greenhouse in which, in conditions of the red planet, plants will grow as an experiment. The first life. This of course is not Star Trek, but at least it's already something interesting, with not such a crazy cost. The problem was that Mars is another planet, and this greenhouse has to fly there. This is where Musk's insanity in the eyes of his friends reached its maximum. He was going to send a greenhouse to another planet, so to deliver it he decided to buy a converted ballistic missiles from the Russians. He probably tried to buy the Dnepr carrier rocket civilian version of the heavy SS-18 Satan ballistic missiles. Negotiations in Moscow failed. The Americans wanted to get rockets far too cheap. And the Russians did not take a bunch of nerds seriously. So that was over. The idea of sending a greenhouse to Mars was over too. The risk of the sample's death in Martian conditions were very high. And the sight of dead plants would not exactly help the planet's colonization plan. But we know, Elon Musk already started his work. He got into this business and wanted to get to Mars anyway. There were no options left. Russian missiles could not be obtained, and the American and European rockets were terribly expensive. There was still one, the most insane option. Yes, if no one gives us a rocket, we will create it ourselves. The reaction was predictable. Another millionaire has seen a lot of science fiction movies and tells everyone how he's gonna conquer the entire universe. The comment was standard, this rich guy found a new game to play, ok bro, good luck. Nevertheless, Elon Musk did not just decide to make the rocket. This time he already had a team of people who had worked in such companies as Hughes Aircraft, McDonnell Douglas and NASA. These guys were the best in their business and every day the team was replenished with specialists. Of course, no one was going to develop a heavy class Delta IV or Proton level rocket. It would be too difficult and expensive. On the other hand, modern technologies have made it possible to create fairly compact and light space satellites. There was an idea of creating a small rocket, which will be capable of launching light payloads into space, and at the same time much cheaper than the industry giants can offer. The development team got to the job and created their company officially. 
So, in May 2002, the Space Exploration Technology was born, which became famous as SpaceX. The company was located in an old warehouse in the west of Los Angeles. The idea was simple. SpaceX will do the critical elements of their rockets themselves, and the rest of the work will be outsourced. At the same time, all the business processes will be set up so efficiently that they can launch rockets several times a month, working like a classic airline. The rockets themselves had to be much cheaper than their competitors. Considering the huge cost of launches that other American space corporations require, for example ULA, this should have been an important advantage. The first SpaceX rocket development project was named Falcon 1. It is believed that the name Falcon was taken from the famous Millennium Falcon spacecraft from the Star Wars universe. The number one in its index meant that the first stage would be equipped with a single rocket engine. Elon Musk, as usual for him, made many loud statements. One of them, the first rocket launch, was planned in 2003, just in 15 months after the company's foundation. The time was tight, but the problem was not in promises. If you look at the history of the first steps into space that USA and USSR took in the 1950s and 1960s, you will see a series of tragic accidents and colorful explosions. SpaceX didn't have that chance. No one would wait 10 years and watch dozens of accidents before they'd reach orbit. The problems also came out of the fact that the traditional providers of the industry were the same as the rocket developers. They worked quite lazily, but took a lot of money. The number of elements SpaceX had to create itself was growing more and more. That fact raised the development costs, but in the end it was still better for business. But the biggest challenge was, of course, the engines. Falcon 1 was a two-stage rocket equipped with two engines. Merlin on the first stage and Kestrel on the second. The rocket's name was Falcon, so the engines received the subspecies names of this bird. As soon as the company started the power plant development, a question arose. Where would they test it? The first place for testing was the Mojave Air and Space Port. Oh yeah, we already visited that spaceport in a video about a giant strata launch aircraft. SpaceX rented the test facilities there, but after some time they understood it was not enough. SpaceX needed a larger and more advanced area. Then, in 2003, SpaceX bought McGregor. Not him, a simpler one. The McGregor site, located in Texas, was already a test site for the US Navy space projects. Now it was abandoned, and the guests from California got it relatively cheap. After restoration and modernization, this complex became the company's main test site. Yes, those strange vehicles grasshoppers are flying right here. The engines were handled by the best specialists that SpaceX could hire. Fortunately, that time was a period of the industry's reorganization. And while the corporations merged, a lot of professionals lost their jobs and easily went to a new company. Nevertheless, the work was not easy. During the tests at McGregor, the engineers often encountered the effect of sudden unplanned disintegration. It's a geeky definition of the engines exploding the hell. At the same time, people and equipment were transported by cars and Musk's plane, the Dassault Falcon 900 business jet, which took part in the Thank You For Smoking movie. Awesome film, by the way. The plane is good, but its cabin could only accommodate six passengers and one of the engineers had to sit in the bathroom. Well, you know, rocket science. The work at the factory was also pretty extreme. Elon Musk brought with him the Silicon Valley loft to work 12 hours a day. One time Apple employees were wearing t-shirts that said 90 hours a week and loving it. And resting program was also the same as in Palo Alto. Cultural and spiritual. Counter-Strike and Quake. A great way to gun down your workers or to shoot your boss's head off. Then the first potential customer appeared. The Pentagon wanted to launch one light satellite in 2004. To do this, it was necessary to accelerate the certification of the rocket. And Musk decided to show to the FAA officials his achievements in reality. Literally. They have assembled the mock-up of the Falcon 1 and took it to Washington DC. Aggressive marketing. By 2005, the rocket was ready for all systems test. The testing site, as well as the launch pad, 
was at the Vanderberg Space Center, but there the company was constantly bullied by Boeing and Lockheed Martin. The giants of the airspace industry, who were launching 200 million dollar satellites, didn't like the company of some startup geeks. As usual, as SpaceX created their own rocket, they decided to build their own spaceport. The launch site was chosen on another almost abandoned military base, on the Kwajalein Islands in the Marshall Islands region of the Pacific. In 2005, the site equipment began. As the launch pad, Quaj was an excellent place. In the middle of the ocean, a free field for the stages to fall, the islands are very close to the equator, which improves the flight specifications of the carriers. But problems came from it too. The islands are in the middle of the Pacific, thousands of miles from civilization, and the proximity to the equator guaranteed terrible heat and humidity. Yes, it is awesome for tourists and surfers, but when you are working on the launch vehicle there, your life becomes terrible. Finally, on March 26, 2006, the first rockets with the DARPA Falcon Sat 2 satellite was launched. The flight was beautiful and impressive for whole 33 seconds. Then there was a failure in the engine. The rocket lost control and fell near the island. Falcon Sat 2 fell on one of the SpaceX buildings. Turned out that during the storage on the tropical island, some elements of the rocket corroded. Two more launches in 2007 and 2008 were also unsuccessful. The rocket managed to reach the space, but stages failures did not allow the satellites to reach the orbit. The first SpaceX success was the payload mass simulator Red Set, launched in the late 2008. This was the company's first major success. Until that moment, most of the industry was treating SpaceX as nothing more than a Disneyland, where the engineers were playing a crazy expensive version of Kerbal Space Program. The second successful commercial launch was the launch of the Malaysian Razak Sat satellite in 2009. Okay, let's take a closer look at this rocket. SpaceX Falcon 1 was a two-stage light launch vehicle. The first stage is, in fact, the engine and two tanks. The rocket uses RP-1 kerosene and liquid oxygen. The stage is made mostly of aluminum alloys. First stage power plant is the Merlin engine. Initially, the first Merlin 1A version with thrust up to 340 kN was used. Later, the rocket was equipped with more powerful and reliable version 1C, providing over 400 kN. The second stage also used kerosene and liquid oxygen. However, it was powered by the second SpaceX engine, Kestrel. This pressure-fed engine could be restarted many times and had much lower thrust, just 31 kN. But in space it was enough. The payload was installed into the upper part of the second stage, and closed by the aluminum fairing that was 3.5 meters long and 1.5 meter in diameter. The entire rocket's height was 22.3 meters and diameter 1.7 meters. Takeoff mass was about 33 tons. I should note that the original version of Falcon 1 was a bit shorter and lighter, but as we know it did not do the job. It was the modernized version that reached the space. SpaceX had planned to create the Falcon 1E model, more powerful and heavy, but this plan was not realized. All the resources were used during its successor's development, the Falcon 9 rocket. Initially it was assumed that Falcon 1 would be able to launch about 670 kilograms or 1480 pounds of payload into the low Earth orbit. But this target has never been reached. The successfully launched rockets, according to calculations, were supposed to be able to insert into the LEO about 470 kilograms payload. But this is in theory. In practice, the heaviest payload was the 180 kg Razak Sat satellite. The rocket is no longer in service, so we'll probably never know its maximum capabilities. By the end of 2009, Falcon 1 had been launched two times, and both flights were successful. The irony was that the great marketers of Silicon Valley made a mistake. The rocket was much cheaper than the others in its class and seemed promising, but it did not gain market demand. In addition, the main potential partner of SpaceX in the nearest future was NASA, with its contracts for the delivery of cargo to the ISS, 
and the Light Falcon 1, with all its merits, could not physically fulfill this task. As a result, the project of the first SpaceX carrier rocket was closed. The Falcon 1E rocket was not created, as well as the larger version Falcon 5, equipped with five Merlin engines. All of them are in the past, giving way to the main project of the company now, the Falcon 9 rocket. But it is already a part of another story. Subscribe, like and comment what you think about this rocket and my idea to continue the space theme. Fast flights and, um, not all of us are flying into space. I think we'll have to come up with another slogan. So, good luck for now. Bye bye.